Good morning, FOR242. Hope you've had a good break. Now we are going to use some LiDAR data to see how water will move across the landscape. That's relevant to a wide variety of fields, including forestry, all fields of conservation, and home ownership. It matters tremendously where the water is coming from and where it will go. I'm going to take care of the downloading for you so you don't have to wait for this to come through. I know you've done this at least twice already, so this is old hat now. But we're going to go to NOAA LiDAR into here and let's see where should we go this week let's go over to western maine because why not this is where a large part of my family is from there's rumford here and over east and over where shall we go let's do grafton notch state park it is beautiful in there if you ever get the chance I'm going to draw my box if it lets me come on there we go thank you covering that area Turns out a lot of this is covered by different zones here, so these are different LiDAR flights, so let's try something else. Let's try drawing a box around this string here, encompassing Sunday River Golf Club. So as usual, we can add to cart here, and that will give us some options after we get into the cart. There we go, next. And we'll use the UTM 19 North as usual. Output is a raster. Grid size 0.5, that is very good for a lot of things. We don't need it for this. And I don't want to crash your computers, so we're going to go with grid size of 5. So that's a 5 by 5 meter grid size. We want the ground returns, and I'm going to use a spline on this that is going to result in a much smoother elevation model than it would otherwise. That's going to make some very nice contour lines, where if we're really too precise about this, if we don't smooth this surface out a little bit, we get a very jagged contour line. So this is going to give a less precise, still accurate, but smoother result when we make our contour lines, which is what you're going to do. So I hit next, I'm going to give it my email, I'll wait for it to come in, and then I will upload the resulting data set to Brightspace so you have it ready to download. So this is where you'll pick up. And now we have a digital elevation model, but it came to us in a number of pieces that I have to stitch together. You've done this before as well, I think. So let's see, where did I put that? Miscellaneous merge. And we are going to search for a directory here. And that's in GISNT, FOR242 datasets, week 10. Select folder and see it's done this thing where, you see it's giving me week seven, that's wrong. So I'm going to clear the selection so nothing's checked, and add directory again, week 10, select folder, see if that's done anything, there it is, I still have to uncheck that XML, but now we're looking at week 10, everything's good, okay, and let's see. And this time, rather than saving to a temporary file, I'm going to give that a place to land, save to file here, and let's see, I want to be in GISNT, FOR242, week 10. And this is going to be week 10 data. And I'm going to save that, open in here, as the DEM Sunday River, .tiff. Enter, all good to go, run. Now I can right click and zoom to layer. I'm going to uncheck my other data sets here. This is saying it cannot use the preferred transformation. That's okay. And it's doing something else to make it work. Not ideal, but that's all right for now. Okay. And now I'd like to right click and duplicate the layer. I'm going to check that on, double click it to get into the properties. Cancel. And now I'm going to go ahead and change the symbology to a hillshade here and make it a multi-directional hillshade. Okay. And because that's underneath that, we can't see it. Now it's there. But you see how we get this sort of checkerboardy thing going on here? I don't like that. So I'm actually going to go into the processing toolbox and search hillshade under raster terrain analysis. So there's a lot of tools that are not under these dropdowns. And different versions we found actually have different things under these dropdowns. So you can go under view, panels, processing toolbox, which gives you this, and we can search for hillshade. 
And let's see. Da, 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 da. So we're going to create just a regular hill shade on this using the defaults and save that to a temporary file for now. Run close. Doesn't that look a lot nicer? So I'm actually going to right click and remove that layer, which is a copy of the original, which is still here. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK and render type, single band, pseudo color, and change that to spectral. Allow that to continuously classify and let's see. Use the updated canvas for the display extent. Apply that and set the transparency to 50%. Apply maybe 60%. Apply, that looks pretty good. And now we have a elevation tinted hillshade. And that gives a very nice view of where the water is coming from and going to. Now I'm going to generate some random points within this extent, and the object of the game is to draw a line showing where the water is going to go if it melts from or is poured upon that location. So let's go ahead and vector research tools random points in extent. Input extent is going to be calculate from layer, send a river, and give you 15 points to work with, and a minimum distance of mm, 100 meters at least. And let's see, create temporary layer. I'll, I'll give that a place to land, save to file, and that's week 10 data random points, and you're all going to have the same points layer here. It will be in bright space. Run, close. And I don't like that one. One of them landed in the river, so that doesn't help. So I'm going to vector analysis tools, research tools, and random points and extent, 15 points. Input extent is going to be calculate from layer. There we go. And I want the minimum distance to be now 500 meters. And I'm going to create a temporary layer in case I don't like that one too. Close, and let's see what we've got. That's a touch better, but there's still not much going on in here. So I'm going to change parameters and run again. I like that one better. So of course, you would never do this if you were actually generating random points for research. Random is random. The point is where the point is. If you're messing around with it, you're introducing bias into any analysis. But because I'm just giving you points to do for an exercise, they can be basically wherever I want them. So I like that distribution. I'm going to right click, export, save feature as, and I'm going to go in here. Oh, well, let's see, where were we? GISNT, FOR242, week 10, week 10 data, random points. Let's see if I can overwrite that. And da 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 da, their name, all that's fine. Okay, overwrite file, very good and uncheck random points, and there is our points layer. I'm going to right click and remove that layer. So what you'll have in the bright space is these random points and the digital elevation model. I'm not going to give you the hill shade because that would double your download time. It's quicker for you to just download the elevation model and create the hill shade in the same way that I did. But as nice as this looks, this is not actually what we're going to use for our analysis or exercise today. We are going to be using contour lines, which we can create by going under raster, extraction, contour. Move contour tool over here where you can see it. Input layer, elevation model. The interval is going by default to 10, and that is 10 meters. So we have our elevation model, we have our interval, we are good to go, and you can create contours from other kinds of rasters as well. You could make a sort of contour line showing changes in average precipitation or temperature, and people do that. But we are using elevation, so it is an elev, elevation, contour, line, run. Think, 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 think. And in 13.86 seconds, I have this elevation model overlaid with contours. First, let's do a few things to change how this looks. Let's put the random points on top so they stand out and change the contour lines to, hmm, let's try a simple line and black. OK, 
Okay, apply, very good. And that looks pretty overwhelming at that scale, but when we zoom in, it starts to look better. We can also be fancy, right click and properties, and then set the transparency, which is accessible through here. And let's see in here, transparency, we'll set that slider about halfway, apply, we can go a little more than that. Let's dial that back to there. And now it looks quite a lot better. So zoomed out, you can still see all the elevation and terrain, but zoomed in, you can still see each individual contour line. Very good. Now let's go ahead and change this symbology to something a little different and simple marker. Let's go with a nice obnoxious green so it stands right out. Okay, there they are. Now I am going to change this point here so all of these will drain down to this point eventually, except for this one. This one goes off screen here, that's no good. So right click, toggle editing. I'm going to select that feature and eat. And then I'm going to create a new one in where I want that to be. Throwing all pretense of randomness out the door here. We don't have one here yet, so let's plop that right there. Okay, there we go. Next up, we need a lines feature, and that's going to be a new shape file, and you can create one by right-clicking on your working folder, new shape file. The geometry type has got to be set to line, so geometry type drop down here, and the coordinate system has got to be UTM zone 19 north, we don't need any fields here, so we have name, location, we have line type, and a coordinate system. Okay. Now I'm going to open up that folder, and in here I should be able to find new layer, and I really should have given that a better name. Right click. Can I change that? New layer.shp. No, that's not a place I can change that. So just give it a better layer name than new layer. Let's delete that, bye bye. And let's go ahead and do that now. So right click, shape file, and this is where you change it. So we're going to call this drain lines, NT, because Neil Thompson. Geometry type, line, coordinate system, 19 north, okay. So now we have drain lines and we can add that in here. And now we can right click, toggle editing, which makes it possible to create new lines. I'm also going to right click, toggle editing, and save the edits on my points. So that's done. And you see how that goes on and off up here, depending on what I've got selected. As with a lot of other situations, it matters what you have highlighted in your layers panel here. So I'm going to zoom in here using my scroll wheel. And now I'm going to create a new line and what I'm going to do is try to tell where the water is going to go as it melts or pours away from this point. And now you have to think about how contour lines work. So this is a line of constant elevation, and this is the next line of constant elevation, which is 10 meters down the hill from here. And this is where I realize I've got my color ramp inverted. Well, it's the default, but it needs to be inverted to make sense. And let's see, where do I do that? Under the color ramp, invert color ramp. So now the blues are intuitively lower elevation and the reds are higher. And now that's going to make more sense. With that done, I can now go here. And what I'm going to be doing is one click to start my line. No active layer, okay, thank you. So again, I have to have that selected. So one click to start. And where is the water going to flow from here? It's going to go downhill, of course, and it's going to go exactly perpendicular to these contour lines. So there's one vertex. So this is a 90 degree angle, exactly perpendicular to the slope. The next one, see I'm going off a little bit to the right here, I'm making it perpendicular to the next contour line. And likewise, as close as possible here, and here, and of course, if this encounters any kind of a channel that's not being picked up on by this elevation model, then it will follow that channel. 
but this is going to give you a pretty good rough idea. So every time you're going for a 90 degree angle, and if you're going in the same direction for a while, you can just go ahead and jump over a few of those. Here I'm using my arrow keys to move around. And see, I'm making a little bit of a turn here, and you can get pretty quick with this. There's no need to be totally precise. We're going for the general direction here. And every time we make a turn, we've got to account for that. And we'll keep going down the hill, down the hill, down the hill. And we've still not encountered any kind of a channel that would be big enough to really carry this water, so we're just going to keep on going perpendicular to our contour lines until we hit that. And eventually we will. So we keep going down and down and down, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and now now it looks like we might be getting somewhere. So carrying on with 90 degrees here. Imagine all kinds of practical purposes for knowing where the water is going to go. You of course don't want a log landing where the water will go. You want it where the water is going to go away from. And likewise with your house. much rather be on a hill than down in a gully. Sorry for that jumping around there. And we'll keep on going down, down, down. See, I'm going a little past here. It's helping me to see that 90 degree angle. And now we might be getting into a channel here. Let's see, maybe. For now, just keep on going and going and going. And yeah, it looks like, yeah, for sure. So now, you see how this is starting to cut into the slope. This is sort of a gully or a ravine, and now the water is going to go right through the top of that curve. And that's going to be where it flows. So streams on a contour line, when they're cutting into the slope, they point uphill where ridges point downhill. And this is a bit of an interesting spot there. That wasn't perfect on my part, but I'll go with it for now. And at a certain point, this is going to get pretty pointed. Let's see, we have a bit of a difficulty here. I think the water is moving around that and just going contour to contour, that's not perfect, but here we are. And let's see, where are we going here? It's okay to zoom out a little bit and see where you're going. And let's see, I might have been off a bit on that one, but we'll go with a hypothesis that it's going that way. Not a perfect use of the word hypothesis there either. And that missed, that's okay. I'm going to go with Bob Ross method there. Happy little accidents for learning. And down we go. And you see that in the hillshade, that is a very pronounced gully. So there we go. We're going down, down, down. Until, let's see, it looks like we're meeting another one from the side here. And that's going to, in one way or another, connect. So aiming for that 90 degree angle connecting with that other stream, and we're following those points down. And down, down, down we go. So I'm not going to be grading you on whether this tracing is perfect, but as long as the stream is ending up in the right location at the end, that's what we're looking for. There are ways of modifying this later. If you want to change where vertex lands later on, that's perfectly fine. We're going down, down, down. Looks like we're meeting another stream there, and we're just connecting all of those. Looks like it's made a couple of side channels there. We'll go for the bigger one to 
carry on down, 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 down we go, a bit steeper there, and you can see this, it looks like it goes around there, the elevation model is showing more than the contours at this point because there's more detail in the elevation model. And you can see all that. That's all sort of cut in. Might have been an old channel there. In any case, we're following that down. You see how these lines are getting farther apart. This is looking like a shallower channel, not as steep. And that might have actually been the way. We'll just have to go with that. And when we're so far apart, we can give it just a little bit more room. You can chase along where that hill shade is showing you the channel is there. So you see there's a utility to having both of these for different purposes. And we'll keep going downhill. You see there's other water sources coming in from the sides. We're not concerned about that. And let's carry on here. And yeah, you can see there's some braided channels going on in there. And of course this is at what year this was, it might have been 2017, these channels, they can change. So even if you've got a very nice stream model where these lines are automatically generated by doing essentially what we're doing here automatically, even with a very good high resolution model, it will change. So it's a snapshot in time and oops, there we go. So keep on going down. This one's going to be short and that's just going to connect to here. So when you get to this, you don't have to retrace the whole line, just connect that to that and job done. So do the highest elevation ones first, and then when you do that, you're just going to connect those two things. This gets a little tricky. You can see there's a channel there and a channel there. We'll go with the one that goes farthest up here. And let's see. Well, that's going to be a very short one, isn't it? I might have to change that one. And let's see. Yes, these are braided channels. That's tricky, but that's the way that goes. So away we go. Looks like that's that. And we're following on down. Pretty obvious where that's going. See more water coming in from the side there. And we'll keep going down, 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 connecting those points. Can't cross that contour line, of course, going from point A to point B in a straight line. That's okay, that's okay. Side channels, braided channels, old channels, whatever it happens to be. Follow along there. This part, perfection is not expected. Just do your best with this and we'll see how that compares. And eventually we're gonna run to the end. So there's that, carrying on down. So the object of the game and all this, you're going to get a lot of experience creating lines, and that's good. Some experience telling where the water flows. And it looks like that's the end of the map. So clicky and right click to finish. OK. And now we can change how that displays into a nice thick blue. And let's see, deep blue, nice blue. And let's make that just a touch thicker. And there it is. So now I can right click, zoom to layer, and see that's where the water went from all the way up there to off the screen here. And all of these other points will eventually meet this. And again, you don't have to retrace the original line, just connect it to where it needs to go. And again, I'm realizing some of these points are going to be pretty useless. So I'm going to toggle the editing there, select point, Delete, select point, select point, thank you. Delete, delete, that was pretty useless, that's fine. And now I need to create three more points, so we'll go, hmm. let's put one here, okay, one here, okay, and oh, where should the third one go? Let's go ahead and plop that. Right about there. Okay. Look at all those happy trees. Right click, zoom to layer, and there's 
one stream, and the rest of these will go faster as you get to there. So you're going to have one connect to all that, and then those are going to connect to it, and it'll get faster as you go. And of course, that one's just connecting point A to point B. I'll keep that one where it is. But start with the highest elevation ones, and then the lower elevation ones will just connect to it. So to recap, you will have the elevation model and these points, and you will create the contours, you'll create the hillshade display as you see it here, and from each of the 15 points, create a line showing where the water will flow from that point to our, what we call, drain point here. And the things I want you to learn from this, creating a new shape file, creating new features in that shape file, and learning how water moves on a landscape. You can do quite a lot with this kind of manual analysis, and it's good for learning, but later on in GIS, I'll teach you how to instruct the computer to define these lines automatically. That might sound easier, but it's really not. What it is is more repeatable. That's because instead of your interpretation of the line, every individual cell is going to be either higher or lower than the next cell, and each cell, therefore, water drains downhill, will drain into one of the adjacent eight cells. Do that for every cell, and you can tell where the flow accumulates. More on that about one year from now, or if you're one of my students who are taking both classes at once, maybe next week. But where that model breaks down, and it takes a fair bit of doing to overcome it, is where the stream crosses a road. So let's see, is that a road? Yeah, I think it is. This kind of a road cut, which you can see in the elevation model, makes quite a mess of the stream channel. Or at least the stream channel model, of course, is going to go through a culvert here, but the model doesn't know that. So instead of going through that culvert there, the model says, oh, it's going to go down here following that road where if it did, it would erode the whole road away. That's why we have culverts. You can easily take that into account if you're doing it manually, but not with the automatic model, at least with the default settings. There's ways to do it, but that's like PhD level stuff. I know people who are working on that, and it is tricky, tricky, tricky. So right click, toggle editing, save, right click, toggle editing, save. Right click, zoom to layer, and like we have used before, we can use this profile tool and we can add the elevation model here. And let's see, we can go ahead and use the selected layer, and that's going to show you the gradient of the stream. And in my work, the steeper the stream is, the cooler it tends to be. So as it flattens out here, I would expect it to get warmer and where it's steeper, I expect it to be cooler. And when you have multiple lines, you'll need to just select the one. So selected polyline, and we can select that one, and it should do the same. So when you're all done with this, I would like to see a screenshot showing all of your lines and a terrain profile for the longest one. So basically, you'll be doing one of these, and that's what you upload. And, no, thank you. I expect that to take you a couple of hours, so I'll give you a few other small things to go with it.